earnest expectation. Let's, let's learn a Greek word this morning. Actually, it's three words. It, it, but, but it is only one word when you see it in the New Testament, most usually, or particularly in uh, Philippians and in the book of Romans, where it is used only two times. It begins with APO. And APO means we're looking down the road, it's away from us a little bit. In other words, what we're looking for is yet in time, just a little down the road. And K-A-R-A -A in the Greek is head, all right? Your head, use it. And that's what it, and then the K-O means to think of a certainty, think with certainty. So we're looking down the road, we're gonna use our heads and we're going to think with earnest anticipation, expectation, that something is absolutely, without a doubt, going to happen. And when you see that used in Philippians and in Romans, that's what it's talking about. There's no room for doubt. We're looking down the road. We absolutely, of a certainty, are using our heads. That means common sense, all right, when we update it to this modern language. And we're thinking positive in the sense that we have no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that what is written shall come to pass exactly as it's written. This is why you want to be very careful of those that dream and begin to run off out here and build a foundation away from the Word of God and start a thought. It won't fly. And that one is not a good teacher. It must align with God's Word, for He is the teacher of teachers. And only within that, His Word, can we of a certainty know. So then it's important that we keep our minds in a vein of thought that you're not going to be disappointed. I don't like disappointments, do you? And if you stay in God's Word, you'll never be disappointed in His advice and so forth. Naturally, troubles are going to come. But his word of a certainty promises, I'm going to get you through it. So you don't have to doubt about it. You don't have to worry. It's going to happen exactly that way. So in as much as we mentioned Philippians, let's turn there, if we may, to the first chapter of Philippians. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me set the stage a little bit. We're going to begin with about verse 18. Paul is giving thanks. He's saying that there are people that will come teaching that won't teach quite exactly like I do, and some of them do it with spider envy. In other words, they see how successful I am in the Word, so they just want to get out there and for strife. Perhaps they were a little bitter at Paul, and he was letting you know that. Uh, then others teach it in love and understanding, but what's the difference? It doesn't matter. God's Word is being taught. So you see, he had a way of pouring storm oil on the rough water to say, don't sweat it. Don't worry about it. God's Word is being taught, and the wise will understand. And that being important. So let's pick it up with the 18th verse. That's what he is, that, has, that is what has just transpired. And he continues with that thought. What then, that both teach it, somebody that's unhappy with him or otherwise, notwithstanding every day or further yet, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. In other words, uh, God's really in control. That's what you can grasp there. And he knows how to steer and certainly will touch his elect and bring them back to this word. Not the words of men, this man or any other man. Letting the wise know you can certainly count by using your head upon God's word and claim those guarantees that he has given you to put stability in your life rather than drifting from one day to the next wondering what does tomorrow bring? There's no need in that when you can educate yourself in our Father's Word, which foretells us all things as far as the overall movement of things. That, that's a great help and a comfort when you take the time to realize this. 
Okay, verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. I know it's going to help me out through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, which is what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit touches you. If you are a follower, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Verse 20, according to my earnest expectation. In other words, in according to my looking down the road a ways, using my head, and thinking and knowing of a certainty, and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed or disgraced, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. That's a guarantee. There's certainly no doubt there, so don't ever let there be any doubt in your life. This is one reason you hear me say many times, Christianity is not a religion. It's a reality. For earnest expectation makes it a reality. Not playing guessing games, not playing church. It makes it an actuality in your mind. Verse 21. It's in his body, whether it be life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So uh, he's looking forward. He's getting on along here and he's looking for his return to the Lord. And he's, he's saying, boy, it's better there with him. But uh, verse 22, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yea, what I shall choose, I would not. In other words... By living, I produce fruit here where people really need it. That's what Paul is saying. And, and the rest of it is kind of up to God. So there you have Paul declaring, uh, whoever teaches it, Christ's word is taught. If it's a nut, uh, you're going to know, don't listen. Always go back to God's word and check them out. Make it, make it uh, according to God's word, never man's word. If he can't document it, and by two or more witnesses from the word, make it stand up, it's probably false. It's probably some man's dream. So be very cautious within this. It is important. Okay. Uh, now, let's go to Romans, the eighth chapter, where this uh, same word is used again. And... In that 8th chapter, you're basically going to get, receive a grasp here of the overall uh, picture. It goes back into the first earth age even, and it uh, tells you of events that transpired there. But it's also going to give you this hope of a certainty. Hope is you're patiently waiting is your patience in waiting. But knowing beyond a doubt, no doubt involved, thank you, that it will happen exactly as it is written. Paul is talking here to the saints of God, which doesn't mean they're any better than anyone else, but he's talking uh, basically and primarily to the election. That is to say, those that stood against Satan at his rebellion, those souls, those children of God, all having to pass through this earth, of a, earth age. And he uses the same term, so I think it becomes very important to us that we absorb it. Okay, let's pick it up with verse uh, 15, as he is uh, speaking of the greatness of our Savior. Verse 15 of the chapter 8, Romans. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear... But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby ye cry, Abba, Father, or Father, Father. One is simply Father in the Hebrew and the other in English. Father, Father. He is our Father. But I want you to grasp the difference. You're adopted into childhood of God there. Not, not someone of the world, but an actual living child of God. Do you realize what comes with that? Let's, let's put it down to, um, perhaps I shouldn't use this analogy, but I will. Let's say that you're a person out here, and let's say that my name is 
Mr. Smith, and I have $20 billion. And all of a sudden I say, young person, I'm going to adopt you. I want you to be my child. Well, what do you share with everything Mr. Smith's got? All right. Well, do you realize that you have that same adoption paper available to you? That the man that created it all and owns it all wants to adopt you? It's that certain. It is that fact that should remove any doubt from you. And do you know something? If you truly have faith, he's anxious to share it with you, to trust you with it. But, and he will never trust you with more of it than you know how to handle. Always remember that. And you say, well, I don't have very much. Well, he doesn't think you can handle much yet. But when you start looking down the road, using your head, and knowing of a certainty that you are an inheritor of everything God's own in your part, then things will begin happening. You'll begin using this old head for something besides a place to put a hat. And you'll be way ahead. That works in business, religion, uh, in politics, education, in everything. For all wisdom comes from God. Example, if God's told you what tomorrow happens, if you can't make it in business, I'm sorry for you. That's kind of sad, isn't it? The other people are having to play where they don't know what tomorrow brings. You do. Gives you an advantage. Besides being an heir to the richest being there is, and that's your father. That's why you can call him Abba Father. This is not religion we're talking about. This is a reality. It can be yours. It is your position, the invitation is there. Verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. Do you know when he touches you? That we are the children of God, adopted. Really, if you want to know the truth about it, you're only adopted in the flesh. Your soul is his child because he created you. He's the closest kin you've got. So the adoption is simply that you recognize what's there for you and I can't understand why so many people turn their back upon it verse 17 and if children if you be a child of God then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together well, what's this suffering business? Now, you've already used a word there that's not real flowery or anything, and I don't like pain. Well, I'm sorry, this old world's got a little pain in it. It hurts sometimes. But God will never give you more than you can bear, and you can go through it like a champion. You see, God has chosen some people, and there are things in this world that if they haven't tasted they don't know how to help others. So no one wants to listen to a hothouse lily. The first thing you would say to that hothouse lily is, son, you've never been out here in the world. You don't know what it's like. That's the reason Christ even walked this earth. He's been here. He suffered even on the cross for you. So don't you start whimpering every time some little old thing goes wrong when you're a can-do type person, a child of God, and he's going to keep the big boulders off of you, and all you have to do is kick the little rocks out of the road for yourself. Being a can-do child of God. That's important. That's what makes it a reality. It's in your life every day. That builds confidence. Confidence brings favors from those that are weak, from wimps. Maybe I shouldn't use that term, but there are a lot of wimps in this world. Oh, you shouldn't speak like that. You might offend them. They need to be offended. If you speak to them and give them the, the let them, you know, an heir means one that's going to inherit something. 
and let them know it's there, they will no longer be wimps. That's true love, is abolishing wimpship and making living being can-do people in this world, all right? That's what it's all about, okay? And um, so you're going to suffer a little bit, but enjoy it. You know, it's a little challenge. How smart are you? Well, I, I, I'm pretty smart. Well, then work your way out of it. Show me. Verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And it's true, beloved. You can't even compare it to the reward you receive for it in planting those seeds, in following Him, in loving Him. That's what He wants from you. Do you realize that makes His day? Really makes His day when someone, rather than, than cursing Him or using His name in vain, says, Father, I love you. It just, his heart just warms towards you. And naturally the blessings are going to flow. You can't compare it to what awaits us. Well, what are you talking about? That's what you're anticipating. That's what you're looking forward to. It's not always going to be this way. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be great. Because you're a child of he that owns everything. Okay? Think about it. 19. And the earnest expectation of the creature, translated creation, the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. In other words, everything that God has created, man, beast, and tree, vegetation, looks forward to the manifestation. That means the first day of the millennium. Why? Well, look what man has done to nature itself if you think creation doesn't yearn. The trees cry out for acid rain and a few other, not to mention many other things. Man in the flesh body pollutes more than any creature God ever created. And when simply changed to that spirit body, uh, I'm not going to guess a percentage. I'm going to say 99% of pollution would be solved right there. Because there are forces that the children of God will use at that time that you don't even know about now in that dimension. I don't want to get way out there too far, but you understand what I'm saying. Verse 9, that with that, but what, what, with what earnest expectation? Looking down the road using its head or being to know of a certainty that everything is positive, it's good, and we're patiently waiting for it. Okay, verse 20. For the creature or the creation, that that God has created, was made subject to vanity. Vanity means emptiness or made subject, if you would, to man that makes it waste, but it's talking about the waster of all wasters, the katabol in the Greek, that is to say the overthrow of Satan in the beginning. It was made uh, vanity, uh, subject to that, because the earth became void, vanity, empty. Now it's up to man to kind of take care of it and make it produce fruit. Not willingly, Boy, it didn't want to, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. In other words, God didn't destroy the first earth age and not give it hope. What is that hope? Jesus Christ himself. <coughs> Excuse me. And the fact that all his, all his children, you, stand to inherit all that was beautiful before and more so. Verse 21, because the creation, I'm going to translate it that way, itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. This earth's going to be made as it was before. The North Pole will not be 90 degrees off true north any longer. It will go back to its original position. There will be no ice caps on either pole. 
but it will be beautiful again all the way around this earth. No floods, no hurricanes, uh, and certainly no death from that. But with the, with the firmament replaced as it was, whereby nothing ages necessarily. It's a wonderful thing when you look back. When you dig out in the, the uh, mountains and the hills and the valleys, when you find mammoth with buttercups under the ice cap tundra, that is to say, in Alaska, knowing the lush vegetation that was there at one time, and there must have been the beauty of it, or on the, the uh, alkaline desert on the top of mountains in Arizona and New Mexico, you find petrified palm trees where it was lush and beautiful, even in our deserts of today. To go back to that is almost uncomprehendable to we mortals today. But it's going to happen. Why? We know it. It's written. That's why the desert cries out and wants to go back to that first estate. Because man, in the form of Satan, even if you would, Ezekiel 28, caused it to fall. He brought it to pass. 22, for we know... No doubt here, we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. You can look back, you can find it, research it, trace it. Yes, it's like labor pains bringing in the birth of a new age also. And 23, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. That's the, a definition of God's elect. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting, are you a pretty good waiter, having patience with it, for the adoption to wit, the redemption of the body. That means changing from this flesh body into the spiritual body. Knowing with earnest um, anticipation, expectation, knowing of a fact, in other words, looking down the road, using our head for what? To think with, not a hat rack. Knowing down that road there is not a doubt in our minds. It's better. It's a promise. Your father said it. It's so. And you can count on it. 24. For we are not saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. In other words, if... If you hope for something and you see it, you don't have to hope anymore. You know it's the reality. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? What God is saying to you here is because you haven't seen that first estate, you, the beauty of it. You see the remnants of it if you have any wisdom, but you haven't seen that. And yet you hope and look forward with that anticipation to when it will get back there makes him love you a great deal because that strength that shows your faith that you believe his word and that you are expecting with knowledge that it's a certainty a reality 25 but we hope for that we see not then do we with patience wait for it that's something you want to work on is your patience. It's kind of difficult at times. But don't worry. It's in the bank. It's as good as a done deal. It is a done deal. We just got a little more work to do. And anytime you wish that it would prematurely occur, look how many of your brothers would be lost and not have the opportunity to go through the last throes of labor to be born spiritually speaking so don't don't wish them out be patient you've still got work to do 26 likewise the spirit also helpeth our infirmities that's your weaknesses when you have trouble uh, waiting think about this your weaknesses for we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the Spirit, that's to say the Holy Spirit, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, if you are one of God's elect, God will intercede in your life. 
and see that you go where you're supposed to go. Do what you're supposed to do ultimately. Now that's not talking about whether you wash the car next week necessarily or get it polished or, or if you don't have to, if, um, if you don't like polishing you can't talk the wife into it or something of that. Doesn't mean those little details in life. It means major moves and so forth. It's, it was a strange thing. Uh, the property when we the first purchased down the block here was the first building in this uh, plant. The gentleman never attended this church. But he moved all the way from Texas and purchased this property because God told him under a tree to go to northwest Arkansas and buy that property. And he was a failure there. It was a skating rink. And uh, he was a total failure. And then I approached him and made the offer for the property, and he jumped up. I didn't even know he was a Christian. He jumped up and he said, praise God. And I'm looking, you know, I thought, what's going on here? And he said, now I understand why God told me to come up and buy this. It wasn't for me. It was for God's work. And boy, from that day forward... Has it branched out and blossomed into God's work? So you see, God knows. And God uses whom he will. And sometimes you never know. That poor soul, may God bless him it richly. Because he moved him a long way so that the shepherd's chapel could have that particular piece of property at a price it could afford. I, I only insert that to let you know that... God moves mountains if it's necessary. So people are real easy to move, you know. All he, has to, all he must do is touch them. So when you don't know what to do, pray to him to intercede. Verse 27, And he that searcheth the hearts, that means uses his head, mind, knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints, that's the elect, according to the will of God, not man, so what does that mean to you? All you have to do then is crack this book and find out what the will of God is and you will better understand what it is that God, how and how he moves your life where it is today and where he's going to move it tomorrow. It's going to be according to his will, not yours, not the wife's, but according to his will if you're one of his elect, if he has something for you to do like he did the gentleman in Fort Worth. Boy, from Cowtown to Northwest Arkansas, and disappointment, failure, and then glory. That Shepherd's Chapel was born when it was nothing but a traveling ministry, you know, um, in teaching. I think we had about three or four churches. I'll never forget over at Eureka Springs, one day a person, I'm not going to mention of which denomination, came in. He said, what are you all doing studying with him? He was trying to convert them to his church. And he said, you've heard about these traveling preachers. They're worse than traveling salesmen. And this one doesn't even drive. He flies an airplane. So think what he must be. You know? And you all paid for it. What he well, they didn't. I did. Okay? I never took a salary, and I wouldn't even allow offerings to be taken in our meetings at that time. Why? We didn't have any expense. I told them to take care of themselves and those that need it. We were an unusual ministry at that time. But God knows. God intercedes. God corrects. God uses according to His will. So the closer you can grow to His will and beware... Paul warns you in that last uh, set of scriptures, some men do it for strife and envy. Teach, that is, for a reputation rather than trying to honestly get this word out. So they try to work in a bunch of other stuff, junk. You know, man's traditions. Usually it's a bunch of doo-doos, you know. You can't do this and you can't do that. Well, bond, Paul said, don't let the bonds of Christianity put you in captivity. Quite the contrary, it sets you free. Okay. God's will be done. It's that simple. Verse 28. 
And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, I repeat, called according to his purpose, his plan. That's a pretty strong statement. Do you ever doubt that? Do you ever have one of those, days? why is this happening to me? Everything happens to the good, to them that love God. Think about it. And question yourself and discipline yourself when you find yourself in a mood like that. 29. For whom he did foreknow, that means before this creation had to groan, before it was changed. He, that is to say that fought against Satan, if you want to know the truth, in the first earth age, the souls that did. He did also predestinate. He set their course for them to be conformed to the image of his son, that's to say Christ, the only begotten, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren to lead us, to show us the way. Not that God was too good to say, you you knuckles heads messed up you're going to be born in the flesh and walk through it no he walked through it with us showing us how to walk through it to suffer a little at times if necessary but to be victors in him 30 moreover whom he did predestinate that is to say called and chose to ordain their path them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. That means he judged them there when they won against, fought against Satan and would not give in. That was judging them. And whom he justified or judged, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? It doesn't matter. Well, I'm afraid they'll talk against me. Who cares? If you're right in God's word, who cares what the world thinks? Well, they might call me a cult. Who cares? You know you're right. You know it's God's word, and you follow it. It is God's purpose. It is your destiny. Our Father loves his children that love him. How precious it is. You know, I'm going to close this with a rather, quite a few more verses. I'm not about to let you go here. But there is a psalm. It's an acrostic psalm. It goes a lot deeper than I'm going to take it today. As a matter of fact, the acrostic begins in the ninth chapter psalm, and it goes into the tenth. And you can be turning there if you like. But I'm not going to so much explain the acrostic today other than to tell you when this psalm takes place. It looks forward to that time that you're anticipating and explains to you exactly what God's going to do so if you ever start griping a little bit in your daily life about what the enemy is doing, winning, being blessed, and so forth, listen to this psalm. Because it tells you what you are, what you are earnestly anticipating or expecting. And it makes me feel real good every time I read this psalm. Because it's real. It's not just a little church saying that people repeat. It's actually what's going to happen. And if you ever need encouragement, read this ninth psalm with the thought of earnest expectation in mind. And please break it back to the Greek. Apple, looking forward down the road, and we patiently wait for it. Kara, your head, use it. Dakios, uh, that you're going to know of a certainty that this word is true and that you're not just reading it, but you are a part of it in reality. It shall happen. You can't work doubt into that word because it has no place for it. It's a fact. Psalms 9. This incidentally relates, this psalm, Relert, re, relates to the so-called wicked and how they try to take over. But in a sense, it relates to the death of the champion Goliath, okay? And, um, and his captain, who is to say Satan. But it looks forward and it's prophetic even to the millennium age. Listen to it, verse 1. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. 
I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I'm going to tell about them. I can't keep it quiet. Can you? Can you keep the good news quiet? I don't think so. Verse 2, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. There's none any higher, beloved. If you're looking for the victor, don't look for anyone higher than our Father. He's it. So don't go searching. That means if he's it, his word is it. And if you're his child, then you would be a misnomer indeed if you left him. Verse 3, when mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. That's a prophecy about the millennium. They will. They're going to fall like a bunch of sticks because every knee is going to bow to our Father on that day through the Son. Four, for thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Now I want you to hang on to that word maintain. That means from day one, when you first started, right to today. He's maintaining that for you. Maintaining my right and my cause, thou settest in the throne, judging right or righteousness. He's seeing to it. He's in charge. And my friends, listen to me. That's a reality. He's maintaining you today, and you know it. You felt it at times. That's just to say he's maintaining you before the millennium begins. Now, five, thou hast rebuked the heathen. That's to say the nations. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. That's to say the wicked one. Satan's already pronounced to death. He's just being able to play his little old part. Kind of like after you hit a snake in the head, all it is is the tail's wiggling. All right? And some people are afraid of him. Isn't that sad? Thou hast put on their name. I'm sorry. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. And naturally, that takes place of the lawless one when his role as Antichrist goes into the lake of fire, Revelation chapter 19. This is prophecy, my friend. And it is something you can anticipate with certainty. Six, O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities, their memorial is perished with them. Even their memory, that's what a memorial is, of the wicked will be perished at that time. No more bad thoughts, no more bad memories. It's snuffed out, blotted out, gone forever, perpetu perpetually. Seven, but the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. That's his plan. You can count on it. And you know what judgment means? Well, and right away people start thinking about, oh Lord, I remember what I'd done six years ago. Whoa. And I got to face that. Not if you repented. It's already blotted out. Judgment for you when you plant seeds and, and do his work is reward, not debit. It's credit to you. Judgment is wonderful. That's when you get your payday. I don't like using that terminology, but people really understand what payday means. I don't know why, but it just seemed to have a little special place for some people. That's when you get your reward, okay? Um, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. Uh, he shall minister judgment to the people in uprighteousness. Everything in an equitable way. Fair. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed. Do you ever need a place to sneak back into for a minute? I hope you know where to go. The Lord is our place. A refuge in times of trouble. Now, all of, I hope all of you, if you've studied with me any length of time, knows what the times of trouble, the troubled Jacob's troubles. Matthew 24 and Mark 13, that's the reign of the Antichrist. It's the trouble of the end times. Shouldn't have any problem with that. Well, what will I do? What will I do when that thing appears? It just told you, my friend. Just told you. God, your Father, is your refuge. He's, and that means he's not going to let anything hurt you. 
He's going to take care of you. Verse 10, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. You better. And thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Now, now, there it's written, you know, and you've heard old boys say, there it's written right there that the Lord will never forsake you. And that's not what it's, that's right, the Lord will never forsake you. Now, that's not what it said. It didn't say that at all, and you're a poor reader if that's what you got from it. There was a qualification. Are you doing your part? Oh, oh, oh what's my part? Those that seek thee. Oh, you mean I have to seek him? Well, you'd be a dummy if you didn't. Where do I find him? In his word, of course. It's a living word. You want to please him. He sent you the instructions. Have you read them? Well, I don't know what to do. Well, read the instructions and start putting it together. Make something out of yourself. Physically, spiritually, and otherwise. 11. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. Make it known. Don't, plan is, don't, don't dump the whole load on some poor little person that's biblically illiterate, but plant a seed and see if God lets it grow. Boy, it's, a, it's so thrilling to see someone that's hungry for truth. Verse 12. When he maketh inquisition for blood, uh, he remembereth them, he forgetteth not the cry of the humble. This is why that uh, when uh, for blood means for those uh, for murder, right? He won't forget, and he will not forget. Does that mean they're doomed? Of course not. Not if they know who to petition. It, it really, I want to put it this way: it really doesn't do any good for someone that has shed blood to seek refuge on earth. You better seek it in he that's in heaven. Because he's the one that's going to judge you. And he's not, I don't care what any court decides, he's not going to forget. Okay, verse um, 13. Have mercy upon me. That's a good thing if you're in that position. O Lord, consider my trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up. From the gates of death, that is to say, Satan. He is death. But you see, there's hope for everyone, even that one that shed blood in the Father. But the Father's going to do it. Why? He's the judge. He's the head judge. And he has power. There's only one unforgivable sin, and I'm sorry it's not on someone that has shed blood. The unforgivable sin is on God's elect that refuse to allow the Holy Spirit to work through them. Luke chapter 12, verse 10, for documentation. 14, 14th verse now. That I may show forth all the praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. That's New Jerusalem. Letting you know, that day came, we're there. I will rejoice in thy salvation. And um, it, it even goes to that time, if you happen to be one of those delivered up in Jerusalem, as it's written in that Mark 13. Hey, he's going to take care of you. Don't you ever doubt it. And with earnest expectation, you look forward to it. You have a written guarantee that you're going to overcome. You're going to make it. You're going to make a difference. Verse 15. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. They dig their own hole. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. They kind of forget where they set their traps. <coughs> Excuse me. And they make a circle and fall right back into it. <coughs> Excuse me. One that weaves trouble for others is weaving a wicked net for themselves. Because God knows. He's going to bring it down on their head. Why? He's the one in charge. Uh, let's take 16. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. That means if you pay attention, things happen exactly as they're written. 
and you'll know his name if you watch that, knowing this is real. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Hegion. We go to the Hebrew here. That means meditate. What does that mean? You got a head, use it. Shila, Hebrew also, saying, I just told you something very important. Now I'm going to connect something with it. That means in this song, stop the music. Pause. You got a head, think. He's, what, what he's going to do is connect the w wicked one, that's to say the false Christ, that is to say Satan, with the wicked ones that follow him. All right, you got it? We paused. Let's hit it. 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. It's not healthy to forget him. Why? He's your father. It's a pretty sad thing when someone forgets their earthly father. Even for good or bad, whatever you want to do, don't, it's much more important that you don't forget your heavenly Father. 18, for the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation, this is what we came here for, looking ahead, using our head to think, to pause, and to know of a certainty uh, that the uh, of the poor shall not perish forever. You don't have to worry about perishing. Those that the earth might consider in need, that is mean of guidance because they don't believe in God, don't let them bother you. You continue that expectation. This is the same word in the Hebrew that it is in the Greek. It means it's God's stamp, it's his guarantee. It's near the end of the psalm. And it's just like when you buy a piece of material right near the end of it, this is your guarantee. Well, that's what this is. Placed by God's own hand. That you that have it rough in this world because you oppose the wicked one and the wicked people, you have a guarantee that you are going to have no part of that trap or perishing. Verse 19, Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. That's to say, earthly man with his ways. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Don't worry, they will be. 20, to complete this lecture. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Shelah. In other, and, and this continues on into the 10th chapter, but that makes the point. That with expectation, that means you don't have to have doubt. And if you worry, after considering the in-depth meaning and the promises that God has made you, when you are his own child, then you got trouble. You can rest assured in his arms. You can rest assured that in his hands, you don't have any problems that you can't handle. And I mean always expect the victory. Well, um, it didn't work for me yesterday and I tried it once. Try it twice. Don't quit. Think of where you messed up. You missed something. Be smarter than that. Be wiser than that. And hit it again. If that doesn't work, then pray about it and go a different way. But do not quit. And I'm, this is just in general. That fits with everything in life. Wife and I had an argument yesterday and I just can't seem to get our feelings back as they were. Keep trying till you find it. Don't quit. Quitters are a dime a dozen. You know? I, I don't like quitters. I like can-do type people. That's the kind of people I like to work with and that's why I like to work with you all. I'm glad God chose you because I didn't. If I'd been choosing, there's some of you might not... I, I don't know. That's up to him, right? <laughs> I wouldn't want to overlook anybody, but, you know, he knows and he can see into the heart. And that's the kind of people you want to work with. Not a bunch of quitters. Not a bunch of people that fall out real easy or the first time things get a little rough. So they opt hard. Well, we all get tired, but you can always make the next hill, okay? Don't ever let anybody tell you you can't. You can't. If you want to, 
And uh, so that's what God expects of you. Why? If you determine in your heart you're going to, he'll see that you do. But you have to feel your part of the bargain. Can, do, type, children of God. So, yeah, there's troubles in the world. But, hey, who doesn't like a little challenge when you're one of God's children to show the world, I can beat it, I can conquer it. That in itself is a witness that God is real. When people see you overcome with the power of God, it is a written statement in, in certain knowledge being observed. God protects that one. Boy, I would like to be in those shoes. Well, they got a pair just like yours. And if you plant those seeds, it won't be long till they'll be pushing ahead and plowing deep too. So, earnest expectation. I'm going to go through the Greek word one more time. I hope it means more than ever to you. A-G-O, A-P-O rather, I'm sorry, A-P-O. Looking down the road a piece, little ways to go, we're going to make it, all right? No problem, no problem at all. K-A-R-A, kara, got ahead. I don't mind using it for thinking, to cover God's word, to take advice, load it with knowledge, load it with wisdom from his word, whereby... Uh, dakia, dakia, that I can think ahead of Satan, that I can think ahead of the wicked and know of a certainty we're going to beat them, we're going to defeat them. There is no doubt. Can do type Christians. Hey, you're my kind of people. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your written word. Thank you for these letters of instruction, of encouragement, of strength, Father that helps us in daily life to be your children. Thank you, Father. We love you very much. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen.